Hi, I'm Randy Robison. This is Life Today TV. And I know, if you're like me, you watched that whole Ebola scare we had in, what was it, 2014. And some of the images that came out of that were shocking, amazing, fascinating. And I remember one of them was of a, of a guy getting out of a, uh, some vehicle or loading into an ambulance. He got out of the ambulance at the hospital, I believe it was, in this full white suit. And everybody else was in these full white suits. It was scary, like straight out of a movie out of Hollywood, right? Well, the guy you probably saw was Dr. Kent Brantley. He's with me right now, as well as his wife, Amber. Welcome, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. So, yeah, so how was it in that suit? <laughs> it's really hot. <laughs> it was really hot? Really hot. Is that because you had fever, or is it just because... Those suits are just hot. Those suits are just yeah. hot. I mean, they're made to be impermeable, so liquid can't go through them, so you just sweat and sweat and sweat on the inside of them. Oh, jeez. Okay, so just so people know, you're fine. No Ebola. You told me recently that you, you feel 100% again. I have fully recovered. There are a lot of Ebola survivors who are dealing with this post-Ebola syndrome mm. with lots of problems, bad arthritis, eye problems, um, nerve pain, and it's... It is a com those are common problems among survivors, but they're not universal. And I'm very thankful, very grateful that I don't have any of those problems. Yeah, no, 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 no kidding. Your story is in, in your book called For Life. I want to mention that. Um, and you talk about some of the experiences on life today. So we won't go through all the background of, of what you were doing, you know, how you contracted it. I, want, I kind of want to give some of the hard questions since I've got you here. Um, well, let me ask you this. What are the hard questions that you struggled with coming out of this? One of the hardest questions that people ask me and that I ask repeatedly is why. Not, not necessarily, some people ask why, why as in why did I get sick? Why did I have that crisis? But the harder why question is why am I alive when 11,000 other people died? Why, and, and those weren't 11,000 faceless people. Those were people that I knew. You know, some of them were my coworkers and friends and my patients. And I got to be evacuated to America and receive world-class medical care at, at right. you know, one of the top medical centers in the world. Right. And that's really, why? Why me? A bit of survivor's guilt in a sense. And one of my doctors talked, came in to, my isolation room at Emory one day and said, I want to talk to you about survivor's guilt. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think I really deal with survivor guilt as such. I, I feel like it's, it's more like survivor responsibility. To do what? I'm alive when I could have very easily died. Yeah. I could have died. So what am I going to do with this life that I have? I feel there's a sense of responsibility that comes with being the recipient of Yeah, second life. chance, yeah. Sure, any answers? I, I think we all answer that question with how we live. Um, it's, we, we all will answer the question, how are you going to use this life you've been given? Some people look at this as a second chance. You know, I, I almost died and now I have a second chance. Right as if there's something inherently redemptive about being near death and then living again. <laughs> right. And other people say, no, that's just the circumstances. That's just, that's just how things happen. You know, she didn't die, she didn't almost die, I almost died, we're both alive. Right. I, think, I think maybe there is or isn't something inherently redemptive about that, those circumstances, but it, is a shame if we don't take the opportunity to find redemption for something. Yeah. And, and that doesn't always require a near-death experience. If we yeah. just take time to reflect on our lives and say, what can be improved? How can I live more like Jesus today? Right. There's always, there's always an answer to that right. question. Right. Amber, I'm guessing you don't have any survivor's guilt. No. <laughs> <laughs> just a lot of gratitude. Yeah. What, what was it like to get that call? I uh, mean, sure. You, okay, so you see the Ebola thing going on. You know where he's at, right? You know he's at high risk. Yes, I'm sure I, you're. I was there with him. Oh, you were there with him. Okay, I didn't realize that. Um, up until I, I left the country on July 20th to attend my brother's wedding in Texas, 
And on the 23rd, he spiked a, a well, a low-grade fever that first day. Let me ask you this. I, I know you were praying for him. Yeah. <laughs> so when you get the news that he's got this, is it an infection, a virus, a virus that's killed so many people that you've seen, right. do you feel like your prayers had just gone right out the window? No. <laughs> but... Um, I found it harder as he got sicker to formulate a prayer on my own. It's, you know, I couldn't, there's utterings in your heart that you can't always find a word for or even a thought for. <laughs> but I did, I did have so many friends who would send me passages of scripture to my email or a text and then I could just read it. That and or words of an old hymn that's that became my prayer yeah. what do you do now you're gonna let you're gonna go back you're gonna let him ever get around sick person again <laughs> yeah that's Pe his people that's ask his that. calling it's his job <laughs> people ask is she gonna let me go back she doesn't let me do anything we we we're in this together yeah and and that's you know we feel God for the last decade, we'd been working towards this calling that we felt God gave us to, to live as medical missionaries, to, to serve people in the greatest of need, to be disciples making disciples. And this illness has changed our lives dramatically, but it hasn't changed that calling. And that's what we really want to get back to. And this is a season of life. We've been given a platform to, to share a message it's like we went to Africa saying, God, we just want to tell people about you. We just want your name to be known. And he said, oh, really? Yeah, really. Here, try this. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we feel like this is a, a season of life. And like all seasons, it will, it, will it will transition to another. And when that transition happens, we, we hope and, and envision and are working towards going back to that calling that he placed on us. Sure years ago, you know, half, sure. half a lifetime. Sure. Let, let me ask you this, because I, I've been overseas, I've been some pretty awful places, um, and, and then you come back and you see somebody complaining because their $5 coffee is not exactly how they want it, and it, it can almost throw you in a really negative place if you're not careful, you know. So the fact that you got the treatment as an American, as a doctor, someone that society respects, you survive. Um, so many people are in poverty, they can't afford the treatment, they don't get the attention that you got. That, I know, kind of just, just illustrates, spotlights that gap, that economic gap that exists between the rich and the poor in this world. And scripturally, poverty is, is a curse, it's not of God. Does that fuel you to, to do anything to alleviate the suffering of others, to close that gap of poverty, to search for solutions so that it not, need not be the way that it was in the circumstances you survived. It does, and that that has been, you know, that's at the core of what our motivation was the first time around, before we were in the spotlight of this gap. Um, and that that is that is at the heart of our, you know, I, I want to do my part mm -hmm. to, to fix that problem. Yeah. Um, have you looked beyond that? Is there any, any broader, you know, obviously you doing your part is, is 100%, but have you gained any kind of bird's eye perspective of maybe some solutions that we need to know? The average American doesn't know that we, that we could learn from your experience without having to go through it? I think, the, I think the first thing that, the first part of that process is to learn to recognize that that gap exists. Mm -hmm. And that we can do something about it. Yeah, that's key. That that the way I live my life really does impact the lives of people on the other side of the world, yeah. or the lives of people on the other side of my town. And and you don't have to go to the far reaches of the world to find devastating poverty. You can find it in your own city, in your own neighborhood, if you just open your eyes and look around. And that I think we often view it as a, a foreign problem, 
that, oh, those poor people over there, I wish there was something I could do to help them. Maybe right. I'll send some money to an organization. Yes, send your money to the organization. Let them drill a well to provide clean drinking water sure. for people. But don't forget that there's also someone living in great suffering right next to you. Or maybe you are in great suffering and you need to reach out to your neighbor. Yeah. Jesus said there are two important things in life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. I think we need, we need to spend a little more time reflecting on who is our neighbor. Yeah. And, and recognize that yes, our neighbor is that person on the other side of the world. Our neighbor is also the person who lives next door to us and we need to love them the way that Christ has loved us. Right, right. Everybody hope to see accomplished in the next you know, couple of years between the two of you. Obviously the book's out. You guys are doing the media bit and a whole foreign world of book promotion and things. What, what, what's after that? After that, I hope that we can get back to living our simple life and <laughs> raising our kids. And hopefully that will, hopefully, you know, it's our dream and we do believe that the Lord is calling us to a foreign setting. So we're we're working toward where that might be next and waiting waiting for him to yeah, well, kind of guide us. I have no doubt that the people there will be blessed by your, your commitment and devotion because you, you've been to the brink of, of you know, committing your life to help others, and God pulled you back for a purpose. So it will be interesting to see where you guys end up. Appreciate you sharing your story. Be sure to pick up Call for Life. It's in bookstores now. It's online, wherever you can get it. And you can see more of Kent and Amber Brantley on Life Today. That's at lifetoday.org. Thanks for being with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you.